Praise the Lord. Good to have everybody this morning. We have a lesson, and I entitled it, Love Seen. Love Seen. We're going to start in the book of Hebrews, 12th chapter and the 6th verse. We're going to see how God loves us. It's clear that we can see it. It says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Now, I'm not saying that he doesn't chasten the women. I'm not saying that, but he doesn't mention women. And I think in the back of my mind that women, especially that have husbands, are chastened enough by them already. <laughs> and, uh, you know, because the man supposedly is the leader of the house, and a lot of times he's bossy or the boss. Not all the time, but someone's over him, and the Bible tells us that it's God. And God watches him, watches the man, and when he gets out of control, God corrects him, chastens him. Now, he can do it in a way to get your attention, I guarantee you that. And... Uh, causes you to humble back down and deliver it. And it comes down to one thing. Matter of fact, everything in life comes down to one thing. Everything. And that is simply, do you want to stay servant of God? If you do, you follow God and His plan. You've got a decision that you must make all through your life, day by day, do I take correction and serve God or do I bowl up and leave the church and forget God? That You always have that choice. And of course, those who really love God, they always accept the chastening and correct themselves with God's help. Now, we want to bring out right at the beginning that correction is for adult people in God God does not quit babies. God don't rebuke and, and beat babies because most of the time we know babies do things that they're not really aware that they're doing. And so we know that when a person comes to the Lord that their baby's in Christ, and they need encouraging, 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 encouraging. And as they grow in God and get stronger, then we start correcting them. But until they get strong enough in God, you can't correct them simply because they're not strong enough to take it. And they will leave. And so we see here where God, uh, in the seventh verse, He says, if you endure chastening or correction, God dealeth with you as with sons. And so, we notice that he didn't say as with babies. He's talking about sons, people with the ability to handle correction. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? So you've got to be strong in the Lord. I notice as I watch pastors in the churches they would not correct a person, uh, and especially openly in the service, until they knew that that person was on fire for God and was really, really dedicated. Then they would correct them, but they knew they were strong enough that they wouldn't be offended. Now, you can offend people, and... Uh, especially young converts, their feelings is right on edge. And uh, they can even discern when you don't like them. Even a dog can discern that. Babies can tell by your voice if you're going to be a nice person or not. He says in the ninth verse, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? So he's telling us that we should accept correction. We know that. 
For they really for a few days chasing us after their own pleasures. Talking about your earthly parents correcting you because you've done something that they felt was wrong. He says, but he, he corrects for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. So there's a reason that God allows things to happen. If things happen to you that's out of your control, look around and make sure it's not God. Because usually it is. Something beyond your control. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yieldeth the peaceful fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. <coughs> so, we know that you have to be strong enough to be spiritually exercised and corrected. Now, we see down through time that many people was corrected and we see in the beginning even Adam and Eve because they ate of the tree and, and uh, disobeyed God. The fruit had nothing to do with it really. It was the act, the disobedience to God's Word. And that applies right down to us today. The disobedience to God's Word. And so we have to Stay on. <coughs> we find where King Saul disobeyed God and not going out and destroying the Amalekites like Samuel told him. And God rejected Saul for it. Uh, but all the people weren't rejected for wrong. We see King David who took Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, and uh, had him put in the front of the army in battle and was killed. And God did not kill him, but he definitely chastened him by the deed. We see where when she got pregnant and the baby was born, the baby died. And Paul, uh, David just cried and cried and begged God and cried and cried, and, but the baby still died. And it hurt him terribly. Well, anyway, we see where Paul said, at one time, that God chastened him by putting a thorn in his flesh. Later, he and then he went on to say, uh, it was a messenger of Satan to buffet me so that I wouldn't be exalted above measure. And God, what he meant was God had gave him a revelation like he gave John the Revelator in the book of Revelations. God had gave Paul a personal one-on-one -on -one revelation that Paul preached in all of these books to us, he himself said that what he learned, he got from God. And no man taught him. God showed him and told him these things. And we know that he said that Jesus appeared to him in person and talked to Paul. And so we see where Paul had that closeness with God, was caught into the third heaven and seen things, that was unlawful for a man to even talk about according to God's ruling. God wouldn't let him do it. But still he had a thorn in the flesh and that was God's correction for him. That he wouldn't get above, you know, where he should be. So sometimes we might have a temporal affliction and God may use that to make you pray. Make you humble. Make you start thinking about the Bible and about Him more than you usually do. I'm not saying you never did do it, but more so. And God knows when we haven't thought enough about Him. And uh, But God don't go too far. He corrects us. I mean, He doesn't destroy us. He helps us tear things out of our life that we don't need, like smoking and chewing tobacco and lying and stealing and uh, there's things that we don't need to be doing that's to our own harm that God will chase us and help us get it out of our life and but he don't destroy us he's not going to, do, to the point to where like for instance we had a problem with my old truck that we gave Tyler and he was driving it and the gear shift went out so I went talked to a man about replacing it. 
And right away we were talking about ripping the whole thing out, unbolting it under the hood and taking it all out and just throwing it away. But whenever I took it apart, I realized that all it really needed was a gear selector, this little thing, and the gear shift. The gear shift and the gear selector, they need to be replaced. You don't have to rip the whole thing out and throw it away. That's what God does for us. Yes, amen. We don't, God don't rip us out to the point to where we yes. are. We fail because the Bible says that He knows how much we can take. And He said He wouldn't allow anything to overcome us greater than we could bear. But with every temptation, he'd make a way of escape. Yes. In Hebrews 10 and 1, it goes on and talks about, For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continuously, make the comers thereof perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience for sin. And so when they went one time a year and offered their sacrifice, if I was good enough, they wouldn't have to do it again. But they come back the next year because in their minds, they remembered things that they'd done all the way back to when they was a kid. Things they knew were wrong, and they were wrong. How they transgressed God. Things that was terrible. They remembered them. And they'd come and offer sacrifices again. And in that next year, they would do things. And they would remember the past along with that year. And it was in their memory. Because they knew that they had failed God. So that went on in the Old Testament year by year. And he says, uh, For therefore when we cometh into the world, uh, fourth verse, For it is not possible but that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. You notice what he says, bull and goats. You notice that he doesn't mention lambs. Lamb was the most uh, used animal for sacrifices. But he did not use the word lamb because Christ was listed as the Lamb of God. So it don't say lambs because he, we know that the Lamb of God took away sins. But he says... For it is not possible but the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. And so he said, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, speaking of Jesus, he said, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. And so we see where our God brought Christ into the world and while he was here in this world, he chastened him. Yes. You might think, no, God didn't chasten him. He was the Son of God. He was God in flesh. God chastened him. Yes, and uh, uh, he says in Hebrews 2 and 8, the quote says, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. And so the Bible tells us that Christ suffered uh, as we suffer. The human flesh suffered. He says, For in that he himself hath suffered, being tempted. And, and, and so... God chastened that flesh body while He was in the world. Everybody has their own opinion, but I believe 
personally that Christ had a will of his own, he could have disobeyed. A lot of people say, no, he was predestined to disobey. Well, if he was predestinated, putting him through all of this was a waste of time. The only reason that it counted was because he had a choice through every problem. Only then do you qualify as someone who suffered for you. If he knew that he was going to be saved and everything was okay, it really didn't matter that much. <coughs> but he said here, for he hath he, for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted. So Paul, he had a thorn in the flesh because he knew so much, but here's the Son of God. He knows all. And yet, God allowed him to be tempted. In every way, tempted by women, tempted to lie, tempted to get angry, tempted to steal, tempted as man's tempted and women are tempted. He said that here he says, for in that he himself have suffered being tempted. A lot of people think, oh, that was only at the crucifixion. I don't think so. I believe it was throughout his life as he grew up. He had problems, just like we have problems. Other, else how could he know our temptation? Else how could he know how you feel at 21? If he wasn't tempted at 21, how would he know if, how you felt as a teenager? Because he went through it himself. And he says here, he is able to succor them that are tempted. This word, succor, is an English interpretation of the word secure. And uh, this word secure means that in the time of harm, in the time of desperate need, in time of weakness, in time of loneliness and despair, he says, being tempted, he is able to secure them that are tempted. He's our securer. Amen. And he's our chastiser. And through the whole thing, we see love. Love seen. From God. You say amen? amen. Give a lot of good praise.